Well, hello everyone. How are we all doing? We hope you're enjoying your festival in the box experience. Um, I know it's a bit strange that we're not all together in person, but you know, fingers crossed that's coming down the line. Um, but for now, I'm really hoping that this is uh, ticking the boxes for you. Um, so anyway, welcome to another Festival in the Box 2.0 uh, tasting session. Um, delighted to say that we have Joe Ellis, uh, one of the whiskey specialists at Edrington Beam Suntory. Um, and he's going to be talking today about the Lafroig 10-year-old Sherry Cask Finish Edition. Bit of a mouthful, but uh, and I'm pretty sure the whiskey's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but we're going to find out. I'm just going to bring Joe in now. Hi, Joe. How's it going? Good, thanks, Eddie. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. You too. Um, following on from the uh, successful Ockentosh and Three Wood session. Um, now, a very, very different whiskey we have here. Um, but um, what do you? Do? I mean, obviously, you you talked a little bit about yourself in the in the previous session. If um, if you haven't watched it yet, that's on the Ockentosh and Three Wood session. I'm not going to ask you to talk about yourself again. Okay. So I, think, I think I think that would be unfair. Um, so <laughs> why don't Why don't we get straight down to brass tacks and 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 get on with the whiskey itself? So what? Uh, why don't you um, tell us a bit about the uh, uh, Lafroig we're going to taste? So it's the newest entry into the Lafroig core range. So this will be part of the regular series of Lafroig, which is always really exciting when a distillery introduces something into their core range, which would be a permanent addition. So that's, that's kind of firstly, to get that out of the way, it is a permanent addition into the new range of Lafroig. Ten years old, it says on the label Sherry Cat Finish, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about actually the cat involved. Uh, and it's bottled at 48%, and it is uh, non shill filtered as well. So, the regular 10 year old that, you know, the best selling peated single malt that I'm hoping most of you are watching at least have tried or at least smelled. You may not like it because it's a little bit of a Marmite whiskey. That 10 year old is matured only in bourbon casks from American oak. Whereas the 10 year old cherry cask finish, you have that. 10 year old bourbon cask mature whiskey. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> but it's not just a sherry cask finish. There's a proportion of this that is fully matured for 10 years in second fill Oloroso hogsheads. And there's a proportion that has an 18 month finish in first fill Oloroso hogsheads. So you have actually got some of this whiskey that spent 10 years in sherry hogsheads and you've got that 18 month finish. So it's a really decent length of time for a finish in those first fill casks. And then those are obviously then battered together to make this. So think of it more as like sherry matured rather than, you know, sherry finish because significant portion is fully matured in European oak dairy casks. The geek in me needs to know. <laughs> do you know? Do you know roughly what the proportion is, Joe? No, no, no. That... All, all I know it's a proportion. <laughs> okay, okay. It's, inf it's information even I'm not privy to, unfortunately. So. Okay, so we should just shut up and enjoy the whiskey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So what, um, I mean, obviously a lot of people um, watching this will have tasted Lafroy before. Maybe maybe some haven't. Um, so what what would you find in a, you know, in a normal bottle of 10-year-old Lafroy versus this uh, Sherry Oak finish version? So the 10-year-old regular uh, bottling, it's a combination of this kind of classic Lafroy peach reek, that kind of really kind of oily medicinal people compare it to like tcp and iodine and you know kind of tariness and but also because of you're using bourbon casks you get that you know toffee the citrus there's honey elements there's a, a you know almost like a lemon bonbon thing going on with lafroig 10 whereas the sherry finish you get so much more of the dried fruits there's a there's almost like a kind of uh, a 
tobacco molasses thing going on with us as well, that kind of like fruit tobacco. There's there's a lot more of that wood spice as well. So think of like clove, think cinnamon, think almost like treacly notes as well. I don't know about, I don't know what you're getting, Eddie, but it's much more of that enhanced European oak. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, I haven't tasted it yet, but I think I could spend a long time just nosing it. It's so powerful. But like yeah. you say, you, know, you can still smell the peat. It's still there, but it's been kind of enveloped by this wonderful um rich spiciness from the from the sherry casks yeah yeah there's almost like a i mean this is going like really kind of i don't know how I don't know how far down the line we want to go in terms of like really flowery descriptive tasting notes but this is almost like i don't know like a, a bovril with like cranberry sauce infused into it so it's like meaty mm. but it's got that fruitiness there as well I think that's that's acceptable level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, in t what about it? I mean, it's bottled at forty eight percent, which is obviously um, a higher than average ABV, uh, assuming it's uh, non chill filtered as well. In that case, mm -hmm. um, what about in terms of um, adding water to it? Is this a dram you would add water to? Um. Yes. And it, it also depends on what time of the day you get as well uh, and what you've eaten. So that plays a massive part. For years, for years, I was a real, I was a diehard purist and I would never add water to whiskey. Um, even, you know, when you're taking it up to like 55, 60, 65 percent, I was always, no, it's got to be straight. But then over the years, I've evolved and I actually think whiskey is massively enhanced by the addition of water. Uh, this one, I do think, you know, uh, a small glug, you know, half a teaspoon will enhance it. Um, so I've just got like a little jug and I won't pour much in. So I've got probably around about 25 ml of whiskey in there. And, you know, it'll happily take a little glug. You know, you won't be losing the flavour of the whiskey by adding in a little glug of water. You know, don't don't be scared about adding water in it. And it definitely, definitely does help. Mm. I know that John. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that the the water has um, it's just calmed it down slightly, and you now can perhaps get a bit more definition of flavour. You know, before it was a, a real solid block of rich, smoky, etc. Whereas now, I'm getting slightly more in the way of you know, um, almost like forestry. You know, it's a kind of um not floral but more uh fern and bracken and you know that mm. kind of um thing plus maybe some um leather yeah That's what i really like about this one on, on the palette i don't know if you pick this up and this this for me comes out on the finish and it's real it's a real lingering flavor of that malt like i really do think it's such an incredible example of malted barley you know there's obviously a lot of cask going on, but after you finish you get that lovely biscuity chewy fruity barley with all that peat smoke as well yes yes well it's very nice i mean historically it's quite uh challenging to match peat and sherry mm -hmm. um, because sometimes they just they just end up fighting with each other and, and then nobody wins Mm -hmm. you know, the sherry dominates the peat or, or vice versa um so i would imagine that the 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 idea behind uh vatting whole sherry maturation with finished sherry maturation is 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 very carefully uh judged in order to to make sure that the the final product is 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 actually you know very balanced as it as it is you know it's a yeah it's really nicely put together yeah, this is your first time tasting it as well, right? It, it it actually is my first time tasting this. I'm ashamed to say, but uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, it's only it's only recently come out, right? So yeah, yeah. But um, I think I would be quite happy to pay the sixty pounds or or so that um, it costs to buy the bottle. 
yeah. And a very welcome addition to the range. I'm sure it's very welcome for you to talk about as well. It is. It's really, it's really exciting that we've that they've released a whiskey for the market, which is I I think I think fairly priced, and it's not a special edition. It's going to be available. Yes. Um, and it's bottled at a higher strength than the standard ten. So I, I I'm I'm more than happy to say that I genuinely worth the money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree. Um, now, I mean, Lefroy is a is a is a very old distillery. Um, mm-hmm. Has been around since 1815. Um, but do you want, do you want to just some fascinating stories around the history of Lefroy and? Um, I don't know if you're able to recall one or two of those. Maybe give us a little bit of background on the distillery and the and uh, the Freud itself. Yeah, so founded in 1815 uh, by two brothers, um, Donald and Alexander Johnson, who purchased a thousand acres of land um, to rear cattle and then to um, make barley. And like a lot of distillers, uh, like a lot of distillers, they used to be farmers and obviously distilling was a way to keep your crop and settling on Isla. Isla, as you guys know, is famous for its peated whiskey. There's a lot of peat on Isla, so they would be using peat as a fuel source. And it was really, really favoured by blenders and it still is today. Like you, like we've tried, it's, it's incredibly pungent and there's only a small amount needed within a blend to enhance and change the flavor of a blend. So really favored by blenders, but there was this feud between a blending company, Mackie and Co. and the Freud. Between 1857 and 1921, this feud kept going on between these two companies. And as the Lefroig single malt started becoming more popular in its own right, um, Lefroig basically put a stop to the sale of Lefroig to go into blends. So Mackie and Co. Um, actually tried to block the, <laughs> the Kilbride stream with stones in order to um, stop the uh, Lefroig water source. Um, the, the case went on and it eventually went to court. Um, thankfully, Lefroig won. So they, they were able to continue selling their single malt. A single malt. Um, we then had one of the first uh, female distillery managers, um, Bessie Williamson. Um, and back in the 1950s, you know, this was like quite unique for a, a female distillery manager. Um, but she was seen as this amazing philanthropist. And she employed lots of people on the island and really kind of took that distillery to the next level. We also have Ian Hunter, which we have a, a limited edition series of. And Ian Hunter started distilling or started taking over the distillery in 1921. So going back a few years before Bessie. And Ian Hunter was the person who pioneered the use of ex-bourbon hogshead. So what he would do is he was he would take bourbon barrels from America, um, take them apart and rebuild them into bigger hogsheads. And actually, I guess we can credit Ian Hunter for giving us this unique flavor that Lefroy has and as and is loved now you know the 10 year old still is just matured in in bourbon hogsheads and bourbon barrels so you've got this really kind of unique flavor that is attributed to Ian Hunter's decision to switch to using ex-bourbon casks. You then in 1994 um the distillery was awarded a royal warrant by the royal family it's Prince Charles's favorite whiskey so we have that accolade as well. Um, so that's a really nice thing to have for the distillery to be awarded a, a royal warrant. And also in 1994, John Campbell took over the distillery, the first island native. And the Friends of Lefroig were set up as well, which means that every time you bo- buy a bottle of Lefroig, you get a free square foot of land to rent on Isla, which you can go to the distillery and you can go visit your square foot of land and then you can get a free dram of Lefroig at the distillery on us. So yeah, so a long history, um, full of like legal battles and various distillery managers but all putting their own unique stamp on the history of Lefroig. Yes, indeed. 
Well, I must admit, I've, I've visited the distillery many times, having been fortunate enough to get across to Isla um, pretty much annually until the uh, pandemic hit. And definitely missing missing the friends, both at Lefroy and, and all the other distilleries. Um, but it's, it's one of the favourite uh, runs is going from, you know, starting at Lefroy and going to Lagavulin and then Ardbeg. Yeah. On and the cool back, road. And then back again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, anyone who hasn't been to Isla, um, you definitely, when things allow, should go. Um, I think the Isles actually have a slightly um, less, um, what's the word, less severe uh, COVID level at the moment yeah. because they managed to um, keep themselves extremely safe being so isolated. Um, yeah. But you should, yeah, if you've not been to Isla, it's just the most magical place and makes yeah, really some of the most magical distilleries, including the Freud. Um, uh, I, I know of some myself, but perhaps if you could um, elaborate on any particular quirks in the production process. I mean, obviously, the, the obvious one is obviously using peated malted barley. Yes. Um, but, you know, there are there are perhaps one or two other things within, um, within the, the Freud distillery which you could... Uh, elaborate on that would be great yeah so there's a couple of really important ones which genuinely makes it unique so first off we're one of seven distilleries in scotland to have our own floor maltings so there'll be a, a proportion of the single malt single malted barley malted on site um, and you imagine every single room at a distillery has its own little microclimate and this genuinely contributes to the final flavour of Lefroig. Uh, there's talks of expanding um, the amount of um, floor maltings, so upping the proportion that's malted on site. So that's going to be really, really exciting. Um, the fact that we will use Isla peat, and Isla peat is particularly um, rich in moss, and it doesn't have any of the old Caledonia forest, which is what's in the peat on the mainland of Scotland. So you've got this moss rich peat, very different from mainland peat, which again, really contributes to that distinctive like peat reek that you get with Lefroig. Um, we also burn our peat for a, a very long time. And another way we get the particular peatiness that you'll find in the Freud, when we're actually distilling, the cut we take is quite late into the tails. And that's how you get that really distinctive oiliness. So that plays a huge importance on the overall flavour and that particular level of peat in, peatiness in the Freud. Um, so yeah, that's 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 something worth noting as well. That late cut into the tails, um, which gets you more of the phenols, and phenols is just the chemical, the chemical compound that's produced when you burn peat. Indeed, indeed, it's funny. I, I many many moons ago um, represented um, uh, Ardbeg, uh, which is obviously just down the road from Lefroig, and uh, people were always quite. Um, fascinated by the fact that although technically Ardbeg uses a heavy, more heavily peated single malt, uh, malted barley, um, that Lefroig would always have more of that kind of peaty slap in the face. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there there are a number of things that uh, on both sides that that that, re, that, that produce that result. Um, and I think um, certainly the, the the squatter stills at Lefroy and the later cut, as you say, are the from the Lefroy point of view, are, are part of the reason for that. And, yeah. Um, you know, so I think when people are looking at phenol content in the barley, it's not as straightforward as that. You know, so mm -hmm. until you actually taste the stuff, you know, you yeah. don't. You, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't necessarily make preconceptions based on those figures. Um, yeah. And certainly for me, you know, if, if I want a real peaty slap about the jowls, uh, Lefroy <laughs> is, is, a, is definitely a go-to. Not to say it can't be more elegant, because some of the older expressions, I think, are wonderful. 
Um, we had a, I think a 25 year old in the previous edition of this in, in one of the, uh, in the petered session and it was just um, to die for, just so yeah. put together. Um, and that's another thing to mention really, isn't it? You know, petered whiskies, as they get older, they do tend to become more elegant. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the phenols dissipate. And yeah. They become, they become you know, completely different. Mm -hmm. It's a good point you make about people getting hung up on, you know, BPM levels. It's not, it's not the be all and end all because, you know, depending on what you're doing after, you know, during distillation, that genuinely does have a huge effect on how PTO whiskey will taste. So, yeah, it's a good thing to point out. Yes, exactly. Um, good stuff. Um, now, obviously, we've got this brand new bottling here. Um, yeah. Are there any other planned new bottlings that we can get excited about, or and you know, is there any plans for expansion? I know you mentioned the expansion of the floor maltings, or certainly the use of it. Um, are, there, is, are there any other little tidbits that we can? Uh, so there's extract? going to be, sorry. No, go ahead, please. So yeah, so there's going to be um, we're going to continue the Ian Hunter series of bottling, which is the series that commemorates Ian Hunt's work at the distillery, um, all kind of very highly aged expressions um, come in a kind of amazing kind of like book and you'll get like a little chapter about Ian Hunter in each edition. So that'll be continuing. Um, and other than that, again, a lot of this is under kind of under embargo and under wraps, but there will be more expressions released in the future. So I guess stay tuned. But unfortunately, a lot of this stuff, I just can't, I can't divulge. But um you know, this is just this is just the start of like the next. I would say. I tell you, what, you you're you're a hard man to extract information. <laughs> second time I've tried unsuccessfully. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be easier if we were in person sharing a dram. Hey. I can be quite I can be quite persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so just I know we we've kind of already touched upon the. Um, uh, the state of the of the whiskey industry globally. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's really exciting for me, and I, I'm probably going to get. There's probably going to be people watching this probably groan when I say this, but I genuinely find the use of single malt whiskey in cocktails really exciting because actually, when you look at the stats. There's only 10% of people, only 10% of whiskey is drank neat, right? So 90% of whiskey around the world is drank mixed. And so the use of whiskey, especially something like Lafroig, which is so heavily peated in cocktails, is such a great way of introducing people into the world of whiskey. I'm sure we can all remember the, the, the first time we tried any whiskey, you know, you'll try and neat and you'll probably just shot it and neck it. And for some people, like they might genuinely never try that again. So, you know, we've been working in, in, in the trade to get Lafroig into classics. So, you know, for instance, putting it into a French martini instead of vanilla vodka and the, the Lafroig and the pineapple juice and the Chambord and, the, and a little bit of lemon juice. Like the flavour works so amazingly well. And you have to think for those people who may never have tried whiskey before, trying it neat, you know, sipping it like we're doing now is like, it's quite a challenging thing. So that really, really excites me. Uh, and we're seeing more and more bars adopt whiskey in their cocktail menus. Um, so that's exciting. Um, the fact that peated whiskey is becoming more even more popular, it's really exciting. Some people will meet and they'll never try, they'll try stuff like, you know, light, elegant, easy going whiskies and they probably won't like it, but they'll try something like the which is so distinctive and they'll find that they really, really like it. Um, so that's really, really fun. Uh, and then generally in, in the whiskey industry in general, what I'm excited about, I'm just excited for these, I'm excited for these new distilleries that there seems to be a new distillery in a month. Um, I kind of, so hard Track, but I'm excited to see in you know in ten years time when all these young distilleries now kind of get to that point where they've got a really diverse range of stock 
and you have that age that the whisky is allowed to kind of mellow out and trying all these newer distilleries once they've been able to settle in and, and see that damp on the whisky landmark um that'll be really cool landscape sorry not land <laughs> but it's, it's early <laughs> we know what you mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i agree i think um it's obviously very exciting seeing all these new distilleries cropping up um but it's going to be very interesting in a few years time when when uh, more and more mature product is reaching the shelves I, I suspect whiskey shops are going to have to get bigger um mm. i mean obviously online makes it that little bit easier for those that have online presence and and, and so on but it's uh, yeah it's a fascinating um, industry to be working well it always has been but particularly at the moment with this incredible flow of new distilleries coming through yeah um with regards to cocktails, um, many years ago, I would have probably tried to jump in the screen and have at you about that because <laughs> I, 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 for many years, was a was a was a real snob in terms of putting anything bar a few drops of whisk uh, water into the whiskey. Um, nowadays, I have softened. Um, I do think anything to encourage people to get into whiskey, uh, if it means you know adding other ingredients to it to, 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 to make it more palatable than, than fair enough. Um, and I, and I would always say nowadays, you know, if, if you know, drink whiskey, how you like it, you know, don't be dictated to by anyone. If yeah. you like it with a few drops of water or even with Coca-Cola or, or whatever it may be, you know, that's, that's, that's your choice. As long as you're drinking it, that's, that's the main thing exactly. uh, and enjoying it responsibly, obviously. Um, good. Well, Joe, uh, thanks once again for, for coming on. It's been fascinating. Um, and thank you, you know, particularly for bringing this uh, whiskey to our attention. Um, Glad you enjoyed it, Eddie. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that I am enjoying it, <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as I'm sure uh, I would. Um, but really appreciate your time in coming on today. And I hope the viewers at home have enjoyed the session. Um, and we'll hopefully get the chance to all get together at some point in the not too distant future and have a have a proper dram together here's hoping indeed so thanks once again slangevar joe slangevar and um we shall see you very soon <laughs>